widely recognized that the United States is in serious trouble in the Middle East. Therefore, one would expect Congress to be holding hearings to determine what has gone wrong in that strategically important region and what might be done to fix the problems that we face. In particular, one would expect Congress to examine American policy toward Israel. After all, the U.S.-Israel relationship, to quote from a recent APAC press release, is the keystone of America's policy in the Middle East. But such hearings are not taking place and will not happen in the foreseeable future. We all know the reason why, although few of you will say it publicly. The Israel lobby, which is probably the most powerful in this group in Washington today, and certainly the most influential foreign policy interest group in American history, will not allow either the House or the Senate to critically examine the special relationship that exists between Israel and the United States, and which the lobby has worked so long and hard to build. Instead, the lobby demands that legislators support Israel generously and unconditionally. The lobby usually gets what it wants. Of course, anyone who says that the Israel lobby profoundly influences U.S. Middle East policy is likely to be called an anti-Semite or some other terrible name. But any fair-minded look at the evidence makes it clear that Alan Dershowitz was correct when he said that, quote, my generation of Jews became part of what is perhaps the most effective lobbying and fundraising effort in the history of democracy. And that the prominent pro-Israel journalist Jeffrey Goldberg was correct when he said that APAC is, quote, a Leviathan on lobbies. Former Senator Ernest Collins surely would not disagree with that assessment. After all, he noted as he was leaving office in 2004, you can't have an Israeli policy other than what APAC gives you around here. <laughs> Let's consider in more detail how the lobby operates on Capitol Hill. To start, APAC scrutinizes almost every candidate running for Congress. Its president, Howard Friedman, told the organization's members 2006, quote, APAC meets with every candidate running for Congress. These candidates receive in-depth briefings to help them completely understand the complexities of Israel's predicament and that of the Middle East as a whole. We even ask each candidate to offer a position paper on their views of the U.S.-Israel relationship so it's clear where they stand on the subject. APEC also closely monitors the voting record of every representative and senator, and then plays a key role in steering campaign contributions to candidates or incumbents who it considers pro-Israel. Those who are seen as hostile to Israel, on the other hand, can expect APEC to guide campaign contributions to their opponents. The end result of this constant pressure few members of Congress are willing to cross the lobby. Senator Chuck Nagel put the point well when he recently said that, quote, the political reality is the Israel lobby intimidates a lot of people up here. The success of this intimidation is reflected in votes on matters relating to Israel, which almost always pass with overwhelming support both the House and the Senate. Journalist Michael Massey reports that a congressional staffer sympathetic to Israel told him, quote, we can count on well over half the House, 250 to 300 members, to do reflexively whatever APEC wants. Similarly, Stephen Rosen, the former APEC official who has been indicted for passing classified government documents in Israel, illustrated APEC's power for Jeffrey Goldberg by putting a napkin in front of him and saying, quote, in 24 hours, we 
could have the signatures of 70 senators on this napkin. As most of you know, these are not idle boasts. The absence of serious deliberation when Israel is concerned is nicely revealed in a hearing on the Israel-Palestinian peace process held on February 14, 2007 by the House Subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia. The chair of that subcommittee is Gary Ackerman, an ardent backer of Israel, while the chair of the larger committee on foreign affairs was at that time the late Tom Lampos, who had no rival on Capitol Hill in his devotion to Israel. As one former APAC leader put it, Lampos is true blue and white. At the same time, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, at the time, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was trying to restore more of the peace process. The subcommittee sought testimony from three witnesses. Despite some differences on certain policy issues, all the three witnesses are central players in the lobby. Martin Indic, a former APAC official, former ambassador to Israel, who now heads the State and Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution, David Lukowski of the Pro-Israel Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and neoconservative pundit Daniel Pipes, who directs the right-wing Middle East War. No critic of Israel, much less a Palestinian or an Arab American, was brought in to offer alternative views or suggest that the United States take a different approach. M.J. Rosenberg, who once worked for APAC and is now a key figure with the Israel Policy Forum, a moderate pro-Israel group that actively supports the two-state solution, summed up the situation nicely. This was a hearing about two sides of the conflict where only one side was allowed to speak. The House held another sham hearing dealing with Israel this past December. This time, Chairman Landros brought two witnesses before the House Foreign Affairs Committee to assess the consequences of the recent Annapolis Conference. The witnesses were Dennis Ross and David Wormsley, both of whom are fervently pro-Israel, and both of whom have worked at key think tanks in the lobby. And again, no critic of Israel, much less a Palestinian or an Arab American, was brought in to testify. Congressman Lampos passed away this past February, but it mattered little for Israel because his replacement as chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is Howard Berman, who is deeply committed to Israel. Indeed, he said that, quote, even before I was a Democrat, I was a Zionist. And he also said that Israel, quote, is why I went on the Foreign Affairs Committee, end quote. <laughs> of course, there was never any reason to doubt that the staunch supporter of Israel would chair that important committee. As Congressman Henry Waxman, another devoted supporter of Israel, said in the wake of the 2006 elections, quote, there will be some Democratic chairman may not share all my views on Israel, but they will not be chairing committees dealing with 